For MedSchool.com, I'm Dr. Sanjay Sharma, and welcome to If I Knew Then, a show that's, very, that's based on a very simple premise, that when everything is said and done, life boils down to a few key moments and decisions. I'd like to welcome Dr. Darren Fried on the show. He's a cardiothoracic surgeon, an associate professor of surgery at the University of Alberta, and an outstanding clinician scientist. Welcome. Thank you. So I, I've been reading uh, a lot about you. You've got this, uh, you know, outstanding clinician scientist program on the go. But I, I want to sort of go back to the to the beginnings. Now I want to just walk through a little bit about, you know, where you grew up, and maybe some of the the early influences that uh, that that you think were really important um, for you know going into medicine, or even just some of the important things that you've gone through. And you, you look back and you say, yeah, this was just a really important part of, you know, making me who I am today. Sure. The, um, to start from the beginning, um, I, although I was born in Alberta, I lived uh, in multiple different jurisdictions in the world and uh, been exposed to a lot of different cultures, different people, uh, different languages, et cetera. And uh, so early on, I think that that really uh, uh, influenced my global view. Uh, and when I was uh, a boy of about probably maybe 11, 12 years old, 13 years old, somewhere in there, I read the story of Baby Faye at Loma Linda University in California, the only infant in the world ever to have received a baboon heart as a heart transplant. I remember and that story, yeah extraordinary story. Dr. Leonard Bailey was the cardiothoracic surgeon who did all the research behind that and then actually brought it to, to fruition clinically. And, you know, at the time I didn't understand all those nuances and uh, the amount of work that went into getting that done. But I read the story. And when I read the story, you know, as a boy of that age, I said, I want to do that. And, uh, and that, I would say, set the stage for the path that my life took from there. Wow, that's uh, that's incredible, um, and uh, we, we were talking a little bit about. I mean, you must have had a very interesting childhood because uh, you, you were mentioning your your love of aviation. So, so walk, walk me through how you became. You know, you were actually flying, I guess, at a very young age. That's correct. So, although although I I said as a you know a kid that that I wanted to do pediatric heart surgery is essentially what it boiled down to. Uh, and transplantation in particular. Uh, I got obviously sidetracked along the way. Um, I got quite interested in aviation and airplanes and so on. I got my private pilot's license before I even finished high school. Um, got into university in a biochemistry degree with an aviation minor. Um, and so I was actually going to, if I would have finished my degree, I would have finished with those uh, two uh, distinctions. Uh, and a commercial pilot's license would have been part of that. But I got accepted into medical school before I finished uh, my undergraduate degree. Uh, so all of that kind of got put on the back burner as a consequence. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. And what is it about flying? Is it, is it the technical side or is it, is it the view that you get, you know, at a few thousand feet or, or what, what is it? You know, it really is that, that sense of freedom. Being up in the air, um, you know, you're away from... Uh, the distractions that we encounter, you know, every moment of every day, uh, the, I guess that freedom of independence and or that feeling of freedom and independence and being able to go wherever you want. You know, you set the course, you decide where you're going to go and, and you go and do it. Um, and, uh, and that's, I think, what really appealed to me about aviation. Now, now we talked about, you know, baby Faye and, and sort of as a 13 year old thinking about being a cardiothoracic surgeon. Like, is that were you locked right in from that point in time? Like in in med or sorry in uh, in undergrad was like were you just thinking about yeah I want to go to med school to be a, a transplant surgeon? To a large extent, I actually got um, there's another piece of the story. I got a little bit sidetracked with um, thoughts about chemical engineering because in the summers in undergrad, I worked in an electroplating company where I was responsible for analyzing all the electroplating baths. Um, and I got quite intrigued by the chemistry um, that was involved in the in industry. Uh, and I saw that that really practical application of what I was learning uh, as being quite intriguing. But then I realized that, you know, I really, 
I want to make a difference in people's lives, um, you know, in a more immediate kind of way, which is why I came back to medicine uh, as a career goal and, and really focused on it from there. And to, to answer your question more specifically, you know, the first day of medical school, when they sit you down and they say, all right, guys, you've written the exams, you've done the MCAT, you've gone through the interview, you made it this far, you've arrived, you can relax, you know, take it easy, figure out what you want to do with your life. And, uh, it, you know, the, the assistant dean or whatever was up there. And she said, I'm sure nobody here has already figured out what they want to do. Anybody here figured out what they want to do? And of course, there's two guys who raised their hands, <laughs> myself and another guy who wanted to do neurosurgery. And, uh, and she kind of went off on us. But uh, no, I was, I was very focused. Interesting. Um, once I made that decision. Yeah. Now, so you're, you're going through medical school and you've, you know, you've obviously have this goal in mind. Um, do you actively start to search out mentorship? You know, are you, are you starting to, to have the conversations with the cardiothoracic surgeons? Are you starting to get interested in research in, in that area, you know, in your first few years of medicine? Uh, absolutely. I, for me, it wasn't, um, uh, you know, cardiothoracic surgeons, I would say, we tend to not be the most approachable people. Um, it is what it is. Uh, and so I would speak to the residents, um, the other trainees in the program, and, and get uh, advice and counsel from them on, you know, how did you guys get in? What did you have to do? Um, what are, what do you think I should do to make sure that I get a spot, a training spot? Um, and, and of course I spoke to the surgeons as well. And, and uh, you know, as the opportunities arose, uh, but it was really, I think the residents that I spoke to that, that, you know, encouraged me, you're interested in this, keep pursuing it. Um, they got to take somebody in those days, it was extremely competitive to get into cardiothoracic surgery. Um, and uh, that was very good advice. Now, now let's let's hone back in on on uh, medical school. Like, you know, from a twenty thousand foot view, like what? what uh, how was that experience for you? Was it, uh, you know, a tremendous experience? Were there certain things that pluses, certain things that were minuses? Yeah, I I would say that my medical school uh, experience at the University of Alberta here was was fantastic. I um, uh, of course I had my struggles along the way. Um, I think like most medical students do, I think the, um, you know, like somebody, most of us who get into medicine are reasonably smart to start with. And as a consequence, school comes relatively easily. Um, and when you hit medical school and you're suddenly confronted with the volume of information that you have to learn in a relatively short period of time, I didn't have the, the discipline, uh, the study skills discipline that I think I needed to um, to just hit the you know the road running so to speak, um, so that was a bit of a shock. The first uh, <laughs> first year of medical <laughs> sure. school was a, a little bit of wake up call that yeah this isn't going to be as easy as undergrad was. Yeah 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 for sure. And, and how about uh, so you went to University of Alberta for medicine? That's correct. Yeah. And, and the, I'm assuming the structure is you know first two years in class, second two years are in clerkship. That's exactly right. It was a very traditional model back then. Right. And and was there, you know, in the, in the at any point in, in your medical school, was there, you know, a couple of uh, patients that, that really stand out today that, you know, just gave you incredible, you know, either taught you something important as a physician or just as a, as a human being or, or person? Yeah, I can think of a couple of scenarios. Um, I guess they're most memorable because of the uh, the fact that I was interested in cardiac surgery, uh, and it was when I was on a on the cardiac surgery rotation. I remember a young man um, who, you know, at the time was probably in his twenties, uh, going in for his what I think was his fourth cardiac surgical operation to deal with a congenital problem, and uh, the you know postoperative day one, when you know as a medical student, you know, trying to of roughly the same age trying to envision myself in his shoes, um, how, how uh, almost atrocious this must be to go through a heart operation, you know, have your chest opened up, you know, the, the pain you must be in um, and the difficulties dealing with all, you know, all the post-operative uh, period. Uh, but to see his courage um, and the way that he, you know, he, nothing got him down. He was in there, he was doing whatever the, the nurses and the docs told him to do, the physios. Um, and he, you know, absolutely sailed through his uh, post-operative recovery. 
fundamentally, I believe, is a consequence of his frame of mind. Um, and I've seen other examples of that over the years where people don't have that same courageous, you know, go get him kind of attitude. Uh, and they suffer as a consequence of not having that, having that frame of mind that fundamentally will allow them to get through. It's interesting. As you were talking about that, I was just reminded of, uh, you know, early on in my residency, one of the, the cases that sticks out in my mind, and you, you'll probably enjoy this, is we, we had a young, you know, a young guy who had a, uh, a central artery occlusion. We looked and they had this, you know, very large white calcific embolus that was the cause of the occlusion. And, uh, you know, I just come off an, an internal medicine rotation, so I was pretty comfortable using my stethoscope back then. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, I put, put my stethoscope to his chest and, you know, he had like a four out of, I think a four out of six, uh, you know, ejection murmur. And uh, within within three, four hours, he was diagnosed with a bicuspid aortic, aortic valve and had, uh, you know, urgent surgery done. So, um, yeah, it's, it's funny how, you know, w- when you see someone who's roughly your age or you can, you know, you really empathize with them and you can sort of see your life in their shoes, you know, and, and, and those are some of the cases that really stay with you for sure. Um, how, Absolutely. how about on the mentorship side? Do you, you know, have you had great mentors along the way? And it's funny, we were talking a little bit about, about, uh, you know, fatherhood. Uh, and, and what I find sometimes is I, if I hear the words, uh, of some of my mentors, you know, talking in in the clinical world, and I and I feel like I'm about to impart that advice to my to my kids as well. So, uh, men, you know, the words of mentors really stay with us and and come out in a lot of different ways. But I'm just interested, uh, you know, any anyone in particular, any you know specific advice or just kind of you know broader concepts that mentors have been important in your thinking. Yeah, I can I can think of a handful of people that have been uh, instrumental in guiding my thinking around, uh, you know, career, family, um, you know, trying to hold all these pieces together. I have a lot of different aspects to what I do. It's not just clinical cardiac surgery, um, pediatric cardiac surgery now is the last couple of years. And uh, uh, having that, having people give you advice and tell you, you know, even set you straight. When they look at you and say, you know what, you're you're extremely successful. There's no doubt about it. But you could be doing this better. Um, that kind of advice, that input, is extremely important. Uh, but it starts, you know, from the beginning. When I was a resident, um, or I guess it's not the beginning, but midway through, uh, one of uh, one of the senior cardiac surgeons that uh, was working at the University of Alberta at the time, he's since retired, uh, Dr. David Ross. Um, he was instrumental in uh, helping me select a. Uh, fellowship position Uh, you know I didn't want to do the typical uh, fellowship pathway that so many of my colleagues were doing I wanted to do something completely different you know perhaps go to Europe and uh, and he totally encouraged me on that um, as opposed to the one of the senior surgeons in my own residency program back in Winnipeg at the time uh, who had a different recommendation Uh, but I followed uh, David Ross's advice and I went to, to England for a year and had a fantastic year uh, for that uh, time there. And it set the course, that one piece of advice set the course for my uh, subsequent entire research career uh, as a consequence of the interactions that I had with some people there uh, who got me thinking about um, various issues that we face in transplantation. Um, there's been other other people who have, uh, my basic science mentor, the uh, Dr. Ian Dixon, who was a supervisor for my PhD. Um, when I was early in career, uh, my first year or two, um, and I'd taken on a couple of students, master students, you know, just starting out. Um, and I wasn't, he saw that I wasn't spending as much time with them, mentoring them, you know, teaching them, bringing them along, um, getting them into the field of research the way that, um, the way that I should have been. And one day when we, you know, we were just sitting down chatting um, in his office in a rather informal kind of way, Um, And he said, you know, Darren, you took those students into your lab. You have a responsibility to them, too. Sure, you can go to the the operating room. You can do cardiac surgical cases. There's an endless amount of work there, and you're extremely successful at it. But you have an obligation to those students also. And that, um, you know, that the light bulb went on that that I got to take this seriously. You know, if you take somebody on as a student, somebody that fundamentally you've agreed to mentor, you need to follow through. Uh, with that, and and it also applies to family. You have an obligation to family. You've uh, you've taken them on. So, 
um, you know, those those are just a couple of people out of probably a, you know four or five that I could name that have had a significant impact on on how I've developed. Yeah, it's very, it's very true, and I think that's that's one thing that um, you know a lot of medical students probably don't realize is, you know, when you go into clinical practice, uh, your you, the demands on your time just increase exponentially, you know, because you you've you know you've got your your patients to see and take care of. You know, if you're in an academic practice, you also have the pressure to get grants, to write papers and publish on those grants. You're, you're a mentor yeah. to, you know, your residents, your fellows, uh, and then you've got family life. And it's like it's, you know, in, in some yeah. ways, you know, med school and, and residency are the are the easier parts of your life, you know, and I. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It is unbelievable. Now, now. I'm I'm quite interested in the career path you took because it, it is a little atypical. You did a PhD, um, and that was where did you fit that in? Was that after your medicine or before? It, my PhD was in the middle of my residency, so I did after I finished medical school, I got matched to cardiac surgery in Winnipeg and uh, did two years of core training uh, in surgery, and then I did three years. Took uh, in cardiac surgery, we have a six-year program, and one year is academic enrichment. Um, so that one year uh, counted towards the three years that I did uh, towards a PhD. So I did two years on top of my six years training uh, to get a PhD. So I finished, um, I got a PhD in physiology, uh, finished that, and then uh, went back to clinical training and finalized my last uh, three years of uh, clinical training prior to doing my fellowship and then coming on staff in Winnipeg. So that's a pretty atypical, uh, like for, for people in cardiothoracic surgery, I would say that's an anomaly. Is that is that fair to say? Um, in those days, it was for sure. It's becoming. I mean, this we're talking. You know, twenty years ago now, eighteen years ago. Um, I would say today in two thousand eighteen, it's a little bit more common. It's certainly not uh, the normal pathway. That's for sure. Um, but it's not as unusual as it was back in those days. For example, I was the first person in in our program at the University of Manitoba to do this, um, and even that in and of itself carrying a, a set of challenges, um, you know, being the first person to go through this pathway when, you know, fundamentally, you know, the department head didn't really understand it. My program director didn't really understand what this is all about. You know, what are you doing? What are you trying to do? How are we going to do this? Um, so, but it was obviously well worth it in the end because uh, it's, it served me extremely well. And, and so when you're forging, you know, new ground like that, uh, you know, I'm interested in the, in the process. I mean, are, are, you know, is it, uh, obviously it's self-generated, uh, yeah. And I mean, do you just have this incredibly strong internal voice that that is just going, here's how I see the future playing out and and you just go do it? Or are you interacting with people and you're, you know, you're getting input from from a lot of different people bouncing off. But at the end of the day, you make the decision or like just just sort of walk me through that process a bit. Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, I don't think I've actually sat down and thought about it very much, to be honest with you. Um, I think, you know, when in the way that you've put it, I would say that it's a combination of the two. Um, I've, you know, from the beginning, as you've sort of gathered based on how I started off this whole story with when I was a kid, I wanted to do that. Yeah. I've, I've clearly had a, a very strong internal motivation to achieve goals, to set goals and achieve them. Um, but, you know, no man is an island. And uh, I th along the way, I certainly did speak to other, you know, trainees that were interested in research, other um, mentors, you know, senior uh, surgeons who had an interest in research. So, for example, David Ross, um, he had a, uh, a strong interest in research and a very productive research career as a fu fundamentally as a, a primarily a clinician. He never had his own lab, uh, but he, he produced some uh, extremely pivotal papers in our field. Uh, and, uh, you know, he had the same kind of advice around uh, dedicated uh, specific time for, uh, for research and, and developing as a researcher. Uh, so, it, yeah, it's, it, I would say it's a combination of the two, uh, which is, you know, for anybody who's interested in research as a career pathway, this is what I always tell them as well, is that, you know, this, in 2018, it's a little bit easier because this path has been trodden a few times now. Um, but still, it's going to be difficult, and you have to be a self-starter. You have to push the agenda uh, yourself and be in charge of that that ultimate destiny. And and for for the people who are listening, who are potentially interested in becoming clinician scientists, uh, 
Let, let's go back to your first grant. <laughs> Uh, yeah. and, and, uh, you know, kind of words of advice from, and let, let's kind of walk through it from, you know, th- coming up with a good research idea, uh, you know, to all the way to a getting the grant and then B executing, you know, getting people into your clinical trials and then C publishing and then getting out on the podium, you know, getting the word out or disseminating that knowledge. Yeah, these are, I mean, it, I, I've got some, I've developed some, you know, pretty strong opinions about this over the years because, um, you know, as a researcher, I think we all want to be doing something novel, something interesting, something impactful. And uh, fundamentally, you can't do that by just continually reading the same material that everybody else is doing in your field. Um, you've got to start there. You've got to have a solid groundwork. You need to understand what's been done before. What are the precedents? Where are the gaps, et cetera. But to get the really, truly novel ideas that are groundbreaking, you've got to go outside your field. You've got to be willing to go to, you know, me as a cardiothoracic surgeon, I'm interested in, in cardiac physiology. That's what my PhD was in. But you've got to be willing to go to a cancer talk and listen to somebody talk about cancer biology, cell biology. Um, you know, go to, uh, you know, developmental uh, biology talks, um, you know, all of these other, uh, specialties that are doing phenomenal research. Um, and initially at first glance, it may look like it has nothing to do with your field, but it's amazing how many common themes, uh, there are, and you can get new ideas, new ways of looking at the same problem, um, from going and listening to somebody else talking about a completely different problem. Uh, and so that, that's what I try to impress on all of my students with variable success, because most of them sort of feel, well, what's the point? Why am I going to go listen to a cancer talk um, or an immunology talk when I'm interested in, you know, myocardial preservation or cardiac fibrosis or whatever. Um, and, but if you come into that, into those, uh, those presentations, whether they're seminars, whether they're international meetings, what have you, uh, with an open mind, Keeping, of course, your own area of interest in mind, but having an open mind to what it is that those other uh, researchers are presenting, you'll come away with with very rich ideas uh, to pursue. Now, to get that into practice, to actually get the funding to do it is a totally different story because, you you know, sure, you got to have the original idea, but it needs to be not so original that the, the reviewers are going to think that you're crazy and you're out to lunch. Um, so it's, there's a balance that has to be struck there. Uh, together with some some preliminary data that sounds like it's convincing and that you can actually do it. Uh, and you've got to be prepared for disappointment. Uh, my my first CIHR grant that I got a couple of years ago now, um, I submitted four times before I got it successfully funded over the course of five years. I took one year off, uh, I guess, just to collect my thoughts. But, um, you know, that took me a long time, a lot of harsh reviewers' comments um, to finally get it funded. And if I would have given up after the, even the second time or the third time, you know, I wouldn't have got it funded. And, uh, so it's, it's absolutely critical. Again, if you, you know, as a young researcher to, uh, once you get gripped by the research bug, uh, and you want to know, you want to, you want to really find this out, you know, answer this question. Um, don't ever let that go as a young researcher, you know, at, uh, you know, it's a tough row to hoe. There's no doubt about it. Um, but uh, it's extremely rewarding in the end. When you get that grant, when you get that paper published, when you see your grad students graduating, them up on the podium presenting uh, their work uh, that you've helped them bring uh, to fruition and you see the satisfaction that they have in their own lives and how, how appreciative they are of your, of your mentorship and so on, it's an extremely reward, rewarding path to go down. Yeah, I'll, I'll share a couple of quick stories with you. And uh, you know, the very fr- I, I wrote a a paper as a second year medical student. I just wrote a post on this actually, um, but as a second year medical student, I I gave someone I really respected the manuscript and said, you know, on a scale of one to ten, write the paper and be as hard as you want on it. So you know, I got it back like a week or two later. There's like a sea of red ink, and and the rating the rating was a point five. <laughs> so it was like re- reimagining the, uh, the the grading scale. So, uh, but but I you know I I persevered and uh, it's funny I, I saw I saw the person who rated it like you know ten years later and he came up to me and said you know. I got to tell you this story, and I think he forgot, you know, about the original background thing, like uh, many years ago. But he said, I, "I read one of your papers. I reviewed your own papers, and I said, you know, essentially, 
this is the first time ever where I wrote to the editor and said, I'm going to take this paper as is without even one recommendation. So it's, you know, that's the story I like to tell in terms of telling the students, you know, A, get used to rejection very early on. Don't yeah. don't take yeah. it personally because really yeah. what people are, all they're trying to do is get the best out of you. And, and I think that that's so important because the foundation that we practice medicine on has got to be error free and, and as close to perfection as we can because, you know, we're, we're, we're yeah. taking that knowledge base and trying to implement it to, you know, real people's lives, right? So... Uh, that's absolutely correct. I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's uh, it's so important to not take it personally. The, you know, when you when you get those, as you know, you've experienced it yourself. When you get those reviewers' comments back, particularly on grants, um, because and the the reason why I think it's for me personally, the reason why it's more difficult to take with grants is because the granting deadlines only come up once a year. So you've got to, a whole another year to try to you know get this right. Whereas a manuscript, you can work on the revision, send it back in, and, and the the feedback cycle is much more quick. Uh, whereas with grants, you know, it's a, it's a, you put all your life and you know your heart and soul into this this uh, piece of work um, that can be you know a hundred pages long by the time it's all put together, and uh, and somebody comes back and says, I, I don't think you can do it. It's hard to not take that personally. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's very true. You know. That's very true. I, I, I you know I've I've written a lot of grants in my life and. Uh, yeah, you, you've got to get used to rejection. But you know, the other interesting thing is, I remember distinctly when I, when I, you know, there was one grant that I wrote and it was not successful initially, and we cycled back and, and did get it the second time around. But you know, we had our kids were quite young at that time, and uh, and like within an hour of just watching them play, you know, I just sort of forgot about that quote unquote failure, right? And it's it yes. kind of it kind of brings yeah. me to uh, you know the. The, the idea I want to sort of probe with you in terms of just life work balance, right? So, um, you, you know, that's that's one thing that I see a lot of colleagues and a lot of, uh, you know, residents sort of struggling a little bit with, with uh, life, work, life work balance. And, and so I'm wondering, is there anything that you do either on a, on a process side or things that you've, you know, recently picked up that have, you know, allowed you to, to realize that there's, you know, more than just our careers? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I think this applies to almost everything that we do as human beings. To do something well takes intent. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen uh, by chance. It takes intent. And that applies to work-life balance as well. If you want to have a good balance in your life between what you do at work um, and what you do outside of work, uh, you have to be intentional about it. Uh, because the, the, you know, the trap, I fell into this trap myself. So I'm, I'm speaking from experience here because I, and I'm as guilty as, you know, every other um, surgeon out there who's allowed him to work essentially to take over his entire life. Uh, because it will, if you let it, um, you know, you have to be, I've had to discipline myself uh, to be intentional about the time that I set aside for family, for example, for trips away with the family, for even if it's just for a couple of days, you know, in Alberta, here we go to the mountains, for example. Um, uh, it's so critical to do that because uh, it's easy to allow work to overwhelm you. Fundamentally, clinical work is a bottomless pit. There's there's no end to the amount of work that you could do. Uh, you'll never get it all done. It's just it's not possible because just when you think you get it done, another you know individual comes through the door. So. It's important to, you know, to realize that, uh, you know, I think at a, at a relatively early age when you can still do something about it. Um, I was, you know, relatively uh, early on, I would say, uh, when I was getting into that trap and it's taken me a few years to realize the importance of getting out of it. Uh, fortunately, I have a family, wife and kids who are extremely supportive and patient um, and uh, have helped me you know, come to grips with this, um, and aren't holding grudges against me, you know, for those early years when I, all I did was work and I, I I'll freely admit it. And I'm, I'm guilty of it. Um, I didn't have the balance right. Um, and uh, I guess the, the flip side is that, you, you know, as, as I'm sure you've experienced in your own life, you go through different phases in life early on, you're focused on work. You want to do well, you want to build a reputation. Uh, as you move on and your kids start to get older, you start to realize that, you know, time is passing. And these are years that, that are irretrievable. Yeah. And, 
you know, you don't want to be the guy who's uh, um, missed out on, you know, so many events that his kids, you know, kids celebrate that they like to remember fondly, but hey, you weren't there because you were at work. You know, you don't want to be that guy. And um, uh, it's hard to see that when you're early on in career. It's really hard to see that. Uh, and I think that's the the thing that I struggled with was was realizing that I was becoming that guy. Um, fortunately, I, I don't think it's too late. Yeah, well, it's never it's never too late. I, yeah. Yeah, no, but it, it is interesting, you know, because as, as a child, you're really – you know, you're kind of influenced, obviously, by your parents and your teachers and, and wanting, you know, to, from an external standpoint, you know, to make them happy. Uh, and then in, in medicine, we kind of extend that, you know, to our attendings and stuff. And so you, it's, uh, it takes a while to sort of stand on your own and be self-aware and really start to think about how you want to be living, you know, your life after doing, you know, 15, 20 years of training, right? So it's not, it's not something that I think you know, we, we routinely think about, you know, that's right. That's exactly right. And I think that's the, where, where what you said earlier about, um, mentorship and mentoring students early on, uh, whether they're medical students, whether they're residents at an early stage of training, um, I think is critical, uh, in terms of trying to get, you know, all of us, uh, to be able to achieve that balance and live balanced lives. Now, you know, we, we obviously have a number of viewers who are, you know, either pre-meds or, you know, in medical school. And, and so I'm interested, you know, a, a advice that you would give yourself as a, you know, a 20 or 25-year-old. What Like knowing where you are now, what advice would you uh, give your 25-year-old self, let's say? Uh, well, I think the – it's kind of the things that I said earlier, actually. Um, the The need to maintain an open mind to not get too focused in on your own uh, goals and objectives that you lose track of other things that are going on around you. And now that as a generic sort of statement could be applied to almost anything, whether it's your career, whether it's your specific research that you're working on, um, whether it's you know a particular uh, period of training that you're going through or what have you, is you know, it's easy to get tunnel vision um, and it's important to surround yourself with people who will help you keep the blinders off. Um, people who will, you know, sort of fact check and, and get you back on track with, uh, you know, the, the real priorities in life and so on. Um, you know, I think that's, that's advice that I would have given to myself back then, um, you know, in those early years for sure. Well, Darren, it's it's been uh, a wonderful conversation. Uh, thanks so much for the insight that uh, that that you've given our viewers. You know, I think, you know, you've obviously thought pretty deeply about an academic career in medicine, uh, and and it's pretty clear that you know you're you're extremely dedicated, um, you know, in, in pursuing not only excellence in the operating room but also, you know, bringing that to to the bench and then obviously to other areas of research and, and transplantation. Um, but I think you've also given, you know, the medical students, the next generation of medical students, you know, insight into into how to kind of balance a lot of other things, forces outside of medicine. And so, uh, like, I, I'm sure that students will really appreciate uh, all the words that you've said. So thanks so much for uh, for sharing your experience with us. You're very welcome. It's been uh, it's been a real pleasure chatting with you this afternoon. Thank you. And, uh, you know, for, for the audience, that was, you know, a wonderful uh, deeper dive and uh, you know into the life of Dr. Darren Freed. Uh, you know, we, I think we've learned a lot about how to be an outstanding surgeon and an outstanding clinician scientist. Uh, we're working on a number of other shows coming up. Make sure to um, you know tap your notifications, subscribe. Uh, feel free to drop me a line if there's questions you want to be asking our next guests, uh, and stay tuned. If I knew then is going to be a regular weekly show. Thanks very much.